Hello, everybody. I am Catherine Buffy, and this is Stories from the Stage. An interview series that takes us behind the curtain and allows us to meet the folks that make theater magic happen, both at the Redlands Footlighter stage and across the Inland Empire. And our guest today is Philip Gabriel. Say hello there, Philip. Hi, Buffy. How are you? <laughs> Doing really well. I thought for a minute there we were. Great to see you. <laughs> Good to see you. And in fact, I saw you most recently this weekend in a staged reading of Chekhov's The Proposal. Very good work. Oh, thank you. That was a lot of fun. And it was actually my first foray into Chekhov. So it was, it was really, really a lot of fun. So I, as I was, I had jokingly said, I could check off, check off, off my list now. <laughs> oh, nicely done. <laughs> and it was lovely to have that reading happen outside at Footlighters. Yeah. What, was, what was your first show ever, though? Let's, let's go back to the dawn of time. Where did it begin for you? Golly, I was... My first show ever, I was in the fourth grade and I did a show called Marmalade Gumdrops. And it was mostly adults and high school kids and they needed, uh, they needed a kid. They needed a, a, young, a young boy uh, to play the role. And, and I, I'd never really done anything formal. And so the director approached me as a friend of my parents and, and I, I did the show and uh, it was uh, definitely an experience because at, at that point, I not only knew my own lines, but I knew everybody else's lines on the stage. And, you know, every, every aspect of the production, it was just committed to memory within about three or four rehearsals. And, you know, had I known that that, you know, after the fourth grade, that that really was never going to happen again, <laughs> I, I might have reconsidered theater. But I think that's, I think that's what um, that really, the, the bug was there. The, 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 that this is, wow, this is really wonderful. I can, I, I, I'd like to do this. So. So you and I met in a show at Footlighters. Yes, we did. Bullshot Crummond that was pretty was it, it was it. Bullshot, yeah, okay. Right. Wasn't it? Wasn't that about 2005, 2006? Yeah, yeah, I go back. Because I, I, I mean, my daughter was born, I feel like during that show or at some point during it. And she's going to be 14. So yeah, about 2006, <laughs> 2005. And was that your first show at Footlighters? No, my first show at Footlighters was Black Coffee. And I want to say that might have been January of 2005. Um, and it was a show directed by John Lind. And I played Hercule Poirot. And that was my first show at Footlighters. And that was my first show back doing theater in about nine or 10 years. I hadn't done anything. And I, I, I didn't, I, I just, I actually kind of thought that part of my life was over. But it just, it just happened. Actually, I was driving into work um, into Pasadena uh, one morning, and it was, it was a very stressful time at, at work. And I had um, lots, lots going on. And I had the radio on, and they did an announcement for uh, auditions uh, for Agatha Christie over at Redlands Footlighters. And I'd heard of Redlands Footlighters, and I thought, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm somewhere in the, like San Dimas or somewhere like that. And I pull off the 210. And I call in and I say, yeah, I'm not going to come into work today. And I went home and I, I looked up the script and I, and I went and auditioned that night. And the rest is, that's, and that's, that's how that started with, with Footlighters. And I'm, I'm really glad that I did. It was, it's been, a, it's been a great, it's been a great time. So. That's terrific. And some folks who are listening right now might only know you as a director. They might not know that you also act or, or, the, or vice versa. When was the opportunity to direct and, and what was that transition like for you? Gosh, the first show that I directed at Footlighters uh, was a show called Murder by Misadventure. I knew that I wanted to direct uh, and I had assisted Cindy Lake in, I was her assistant director for a show. You were also in this show. We did, we did all of our shows together at Footlighters in those days. Um, and then it, I applied the next season and I, I got murdered by Misadventure. And I, I was really excited. And uh, you had agreed to be my assistant director. So I had to, you're my, my, my partner in crime at that, at that point. And we held auditions as one does. And nobody came. 
<laughs> if you remember that. So we kind of scrambled and we put a show together and it was, um, it was definitely an experience, but I, I honestly couldn't have done, I couldn't have done that first show without you, uh, really. And I think at that point I was so focused on, on, on details, like everything from the set to the lighting to the, just, just the whole thing. In fact, I remember conversations I had with you at three in the morning painting <laughs> the, the set for, for, um, for Murder by Misadventure, and and we we were just down to the minutia. No, we've got to repaint that door again. It's three in the morning, and, and but you know you were you were right there. You were right there with me, and, and that just that level of detail that we did was um, w was pretty incredible <laughs> for that for that particular set. And uh, so anyway, uh, we I ended up I, I ended up being in the show uh, and and directing, which you know honestly hindsight I it, it's something I've definitely avoided doing. Um, you, you know, since then, I, I mean, you know, as an actor, um, I, I really feel like we need to have uh, direction. I don't care where it is. You need to have that. You need to have that of uh, that other eye, which actually you were during Murder by Misadventure. So, I mean, I really feel like it was the show that we did between the two of us, because when I wasn't on stage, you were kind of looking to see what we needed to do. And I, it, we made it work. But uh, that was it was probably more stressful than it, than it needed to be um, at that time. But, but you know, we were, we were green. <laughs> All right. Well, that's a great example of one of those theater nightmares that turned out to be a really brilliant and precious learning experience. Yeah. And you have gone on to direct many other shows and in fact have become something, made something of a name for yourself with large productions. So talk about the transition to managing, going from the small, managing the detail, learning on the job kinds of productions, all the way up to the larger, full scale, large cast productions. What are the differences? What have you learned along the way? I think every, every experience is new. So, and, and that's the great thing about theater. You mean, you might have done theater for 30, 40, 50 plus years. It, there's always something that's going to happen on stage, something that's going to happen during a production that you've never seen before. Um, and that's, that's exhilarating actually. It really is. Uh, so that's, that's part of the, uh, that's part of the appeal to me as a director. Um, the transition between it, it's, it's, hmm, I'd say it's time management, um, time management because in, in the context of um, community theater, you've really only got a finite amount of time. Uh, to be able to get something like that done, you know, best case scenario, maybe six weeks, worst case scenario, you know, four weeks, but, and you've, you've got to really be able to know how to construct your time and your rehearsal uh, process in, in that time frame. So I, a very wise director, uh, Cindy Lake said to me that 20 rehearsals was the absolute minimum that you absolutely needed to have for any kind of show to be a success. And if you if you had less, you got into dangerous territory. If you had more, great, you look at that as a bonus. So anytime, and especially with large casts, anytime uh, I, I do, I sit down with a grid, I try to construct as, as, as many uh, rehearsals as I possibly can, you know, based on that 20 rehearsal uh, template and and that's that's actually worked for me very well over over all productions whether it's small large but particularly large cast like the last show that I did there uh, was uh, murder on the Nile in the last fall it just seems like seven years ago because you know it was just before the apocalypse and so it just it's it seems like much longer uh, ago than it was uh, we had what 12 13 14 people in the cast plus a lot of peripheral uh you know things going on before the show during during intermission that was all just needed to be kind of orchestrated and folded into that so that that 20 rehearsal uh process was very important for a show like that and so uh, thank you cindy for that <laughs> and what would you say is the secret to working with actors you've been you you are an actor and you've directed actors. So what do you think actors need from a director in an ideal case? Well, first and foremost, I know this is gonna sound uh, silly and, and, and repetitive, but what actors need, actors need direction. They really just need to be told what to do. And, and I think, you know, when you come into a directing 
um, experience and, and you've been an actor yourself, you, you, you automatically know that that's what you, what you need. So that's, that's what I try to give them. They, they need to know where, not just the technical part of it, you know, not just where to stand, hit, hit your mark, hit, and, you know, get into the right place for your lights, but you, they need to know, they need to know everything that uh, they, they, they most often they'll want direction for character. And, and then when you can explore that together and you can speak their language as an actor, uh, I, I think that really helps. I, I personally, I've had directors over the years um, that have not been able to communicate with me uh, as, as an actor uh, because they've, mm, I, I guess it's because they don't speak the language. They're so focused on technical aspects of it that, that they don't know exactly what it is they're asking me to do. It's, it's like the old adage that, you know, the direction you get, oh, that's, that's great, Philip, uh, but could you do that again? But could you be funnier? You know, how do you, how do you, how do you quantify that? I think what I try to do with actors is I, I try to quantify my direction with, with very specific things. Okay, this isn't working. We'll do this and this and this, um, you know, and, and keep trying it. I, you know, I, I had the benefit of working for five years for a, a company called Gourmet Detective. And basically uh, we would do the same show for, you know, a, a year, maybe a year plus. So that helped me hone my skills to be able to try different things and, and know what works very quickly. So that I was able to bring back to community theater to in, in just, just in terms of, um, I know that this isn't going to work. We're not going to try it. We're going to do it this way. And we, we're going to do it. And, and that compacts the, the rehearsal process. Does that, does that make sense? It does. It does. Okay. <laughs> Maybe to an actor. <laughs> <laughs> I, I speak your language. So you here's a little bit in, in your in your personal life. You have a talent and an eye for antiques and collectibles and the things that um, people want to collect, things that beautify the home. How does that eye and that experience show up on stage? It's, it's a help and a hindrance. Unfortunately, my background in antiques and, and, and period design and things like that translate into, I really know when something is wrong. And I have this overwhelming need to fix it uh, and, and not make it wrong. Um, I'll do everything I can to make it as absolutely period as I can, but I probably do m maybe more than I should uh, in that direction. And if I had than if I if I didn't know that it wasn't right you know I, I mean and I even do I even sit there and I'll, I'll watch productions or even television productions and you know they're supposed to be somewhere uh, different than they are and all of a sudden they have um, a light switch that's just that's American you know and you're supposed to be in Italy that's, I, and, and then I, it's completely blown for me so I guess what I try to do is I try to bring in that whole experience so when the audience sits down and they sit and they're, they're looking at the set because there's a lot of time, you know, before the show, you're sitting down, you know, that they, they have uh, an opportunity to let their eye roam around the set. And I want everything to be absolutely authentic. And, and that's that's what I strive for. So it, it's a curse and it's it's a it's a it's a benefit, I guess. Well, a benefit for us as the audience. So <laughs> thank you. So before I let you go, I wonder if you'd be willing to transition with me into just a fun little quiz where I'll throw a couple of things your way and give okay. you an opportunity to just answer with whatever comes to mind. Okay. And, and perhaps your friend behind your shoulder there can help you. Yeah, that's, that's a non such the cat and she's definitely like to make appearance on this. <laughs> oh. And she's welcome at any point. Oh, wait, are you ready to go? Yeah, okay. I'm ready. Okay. Favorite okay. kind of donut? Oh, uh, anything with chocolate. Um, and, and the more chocolate, the better. Favorite kind of pizza or pizza topping? Canadian bacon and pineapple. And that, that's very controversial, but yeah. <laughs> I love them both. All right. We're going to roll with it. Yeah. Apple or Android? Oh, Apple for sure. Hula hoops or yo-yos? Oh, I'm terrible at both. Uh, I'd probably have more of a chance of doing a yo-yo. <laughs> Art Nouveau or Art Deco? Art Deco, yeah, for sure. How many hats, approximately, are in your home right now? Hats. Maybe 20. Because I have 
yeah, my, if you have to count my daughter's hat collection, it, it's burgeoning as, as we speak. Approximately how many candles in your home right now? Ooh, um, maybe two real ones. We use just electronic ones now. If you had to sum up the meaning of life in a tattoo, what would it be? Wow. Well, that's profound, isn't it? Gosh, that goes into the... Um, hmm. A phoenix. Nice. Yeah. And speaking of rebirth after fire, what is the <laughs> very first thing you want to do when this pandemic is for real and for trues over? Um... I, I want to have a huge get together and I want to hug all of the friends and family that, uh, you know, that I just, I just haven't been able to do. That's, that's, that's been the most difficult thing. And then maybe go to Disneyland. I don't know. <laughs> maybe hug everyone at Disneyland. <laughs> no, I don't want to hug everybody at Disneyland. Yeah. That's, that's, I'm, I'm not that touchy feely. I, I really, I, I really miss, I really miss the connection with people, not only just with family, but with just with friends. And, you know, when you go out and you say, we're, we're theater people, we're kind of huggy and we're, we're touchy feeling. And man, that's been, that's been really, really tough because, you know, you see somebody and your reaction is to go and hug them. And, and, and when a hug becomes life threatening or possibly life threatening, it's just, it's, it's, that's heartbreaking to me. That's, that's been the hardest thing. Well, I look forward to giving you a big hug <laughs> sooner rather than later. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much, Philip. This has been a Thank pleasure. You. Thank you, Buffy. It's always a pleasure. Mm -hmm.